Amen. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for staying up here, choir. I get awfully lonesome up here on Sunday night. <laughs> Appreciate your being here. Hasn't it been good tonight? It always is. I say that every Sunday night, but it's true. It's been very good. And I really, I really love the trombones. I don't know how in the world they do that. They're not really swallowing it, are they, Larry? <laughs> but it's good to have it. It's good to have it. Today, we're going to look again at the book of Revelation. We're going to look at the third church, the one, the church at Pergamum. Now, Pergamum is still there. If you go to Turkey, you'll find Bergamus, and that's Pergamum. It's not near the nice place that it was in this day, but it's still there and still thriving and uh, has about 200,000 people there. Pergamum was rich, intellectual, uh, ascetic. They loved art and architecture. They loved philosophy and painting. Their Acropolis was more famous than the one in Athens or the one in Corinth that we go to see nowadays. Uh, they were a healing center. They had a clinic there that was known from far and wide. It was kind of a kooky thing. Uh, they, had, they believed that snakes had healing powers, and it was kind of a pagan worship thing, and they had all these non-poisonous snakes. And the idea was to spend the night in this clinic, and if a snake crawled into your room and crawled over you, you'd get well. I think I would probably die right on the spot. But they, <laughs> but they, uh, they had that belief, and it was well known, and, and their, their symbol was a snake put up on a pole, and people would come there for all over. They were famous for their library. Their library had 200,000 volumes. Now, this was back when things were written, handwritten, word after word after word, 200,000 volumes. In fact, the king of Pergamos decided that he wanted the, the great, uh, our, the great uh, uh, leader of the bookstore in Alexandria. His name was Aristophanes. He wanted the librarian of Aristophanes, named Aristophanes, to come. And Ptolemy, who was the king of Egypt, heard about this. He had Aristophanes put in prison, so he couldn't go. And he wasn't going to let anybody steal his librarian, and so he locked him up for a long, long while. And he not only did that, but he stopped, the, he stopped all of the transfer of papyri from Egypt to this part of the country, to Asia. Now, papyri was all they had to write on. All of it came from Egypt. They made out of the flax of, from the things growing in the Nile River, and they made a kind of a paper out of it and, uh, and wrote on that. And so here that was all cut up. So this forced them to begin to dry animal skins, and they, they came up with the way of processing parchment. Uh, you caught, people who graduated from college got a sheepskin, they call it, one time. Well, that's where it all came from. It came out of this accident, out of this uh, incident. And the fact is that... Uh, the, the things that were written on the parchment, of course, lasted so much longer than on the papyri, so this was an improvement, was much better, and this, arc, and this library was very, very well known. It was a wonderful place. Wouldn't you want to live in a place that was clean and rich and had a world-famous Acropolis, and people were, were uh, doing well there, and, and Rome was treating this town very, very nicely, and everything was going well. It's a good place to live. And then there's one last line that's put here, where Satan has his throne. Now let's, let's look at it, beginning in verse 12 of Revelation chapter 2. To the angel, or to the messenger of the church in Pergamum write, these are the words of him who has the sharp, double-edged sword. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. Yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. You have people there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin by eating food sacrificed to idols and by committing sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Repent, therefore, Otherwise, I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give him a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to him who receives it. There's a great deal in this letter to the church in Pergamum. It, it talks about many things. There's praise and condemnation and warning and reward. And all of these, I think, we could apply to ourselves and saying these are things that we need to take, take heed of and look at and say, what does God's Word have to say to us? In verse 13, 
He talks about it's harder to live in some places for the Lord than others. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. It's harder in some place than others. Where Satan has his throne, what, what does that mean? You realize that Satan cannot be everywhere. Satan is a fallen angel. He has a worldwide organization. He has demons and all kinds of, uh, of little imps all over the place. But Satan cannot be but one place at one time. He is not uh, omnipresent like God. He is not near like God. He is just an angel who has fallen, who's very, very sharp, who has taken over this world by telling us what we want to hear and enticing us to destroy ourselves, for that's his purpose. But he can't be everywhere. So that makes it even more significant that here is where Satan has his throne. Now, what is that? What does it mean where Satan has his throne, where he has set up headquarters? Well, some have said that it, it, it simply means that the city was so evil and the city was very, very sensuous and sensuality and sexual immorality was very much a part of the lifestyle of most everybody in those days. And it was a very, very sensual place. It was a very evil place and they were very self-centered and they were very much caught up in getting just for themselves and for no others and they, they didn't care about each other very much. And there are a lot of those things that, that were going on. but. I really believe from the, what he said here in the 16th verse that he's saying to us that the place where Caesar was worshipped is where Satan's throne is. And they were given very special privileges by Caesar. They were given the right of the sword. Caesar was so worshipped there. Everybody lined up and said, Caesar is Lord. Not many of them meant it. Uh, we find that in a lot of religions and a lot of things, but, but they said it because it got them in good stead with Caesar. And like I said last week, Rome was very good for these turkey cities because now they didn't have to be afraid of each other. They didn't have to be afraid of a neighbor coming on and attacking them or trying to scale the walls and get to them. Rome had forced a peace all over the world. And so they were, they were blessed by that. They wanted to make Rome happy. And the way Rome happy, you, you worshiped Caesar and you said Caesar is Lord. Well, fact is that Christians couldn't say that. Somebody would say, well, what difference does it make? You don't have to mean it. You don't have to mean anything by it. But Christian to Christians, the Lord says here, I thank you. I'm thankful to you that you have, uh, you did not renounce your faith in me. You remain true to my name in verse 13. Do you realize how, how important the name of God is to him? What do you think about the name God? How do you use the word God? Do you use it to say this is the name of the most important person in my life? the most important being around, how you use the name of God is very much a part of your judgment, very much a part of your spirituality. How do you use the name of God? He said to these people, you would not take the name Lord and apply it to Caesar. And therefore you are praised because you, you did not, you remain true to my name. You didn't renounce your faith in me even the days of Antipas, my faithful witness who was put to death. Now, in this place where Satan lives, Antipas was put to death by the Roman governor there. They were one of those few places in the Roman Empire that had the right of the sword. That means they had the right to put somebody to death. Remember, Jerusalem didn't have that right. The Israelites did not have the right to put someone to death. That's why Jesus had to be tried by Herod and by Pilate. They were secular Roman governors of the area, and they were the only ones who give anyone the right to put to death by sword. But this was one of those places that, uh, that had the right to put people to death by, by sword. And he said, uh, you have an heritage of sacrifice, but he said, remember, I am the Lord with a double-edged sword. The rulers in your town have a sword, but God says, I am the one with the double-edged sword. And you have this heritage of sacrifice. Antipas was probably the first Christian martyr just a few years before Polycarp over at Smyrna, over at Pergamos. In verses 14 and 15, he talks about the condemnation of the church. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. You have people there who hold to the teaching of Balaam who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin. Do you know what this is about? Remember in the book of Numbers, 
There was a time when the Israelites were coming across the country. Everybody was afraid of them. They were powerful because God was with them. They were winning all the battles. They seemed to be just completely undefeatable. And Balak, this king of a land they were approaching, wanted to find some way to stop the blessings of God on them. So he got Balaam, who was a prophet, and the kind of a prophet that seemed to be willing to compromise a little bit, especially for a few dollars. And then they, and he got him to, to say, I, he, got, he contracted with him to look down upon the people of Israel and their armies and to place a curse upon them or to place some kind of thing that would take away God's power. And he stood up there and he said, I can't do it. These are God's people and I, I can't do it. I'm not able to do that. It's not possible. And then he had to go away. Well, two or three times he was asked to do that, and he thought he would try and, and get by with getting a lot of money from the king, but he just found he couldn't do it when the time came. And then he told the king, I'll tell you how you can get them to bring God's punishment upon themselves. You send these beautiful women down there. You send uh, this feast, and you have this party and this orgy, and you get them to sin against God, and he will have to curse them. And that's what Balaam did. And that's what he's saying. You're, you're trying to mix the things of the world with the things of God. You're trying to live like one person on Saturday night and another on Sunday morning and another on Monday morning. You're bringing together the things of the world into the things of God and you're mixing all this up. You're living the life of Balaam. Mr. Push me, pull me. Uh, Mr. Facing both ways. He, he wanted to love God. In fact, he had said one time, Balaam had said, Lord, I, he saw a man die a death of, of faith. He was so impressed with this man's faith when he was dying. He said, Lord, I want my last days to be like his. And he had said that. But also, he sure did want to get riches. He sure loved money. And so he did what he did to get the payment from, from Balak. And Balaam was Mr. Facing both ways. And the Lord is saying, I have this against you. There are those in your church who are like that. You're facing both ways. You love the world. You love it so very much. And yet you, you love me too. And you're halfway interested in that. And you need to know you cannot be Mr. Looking both ways. And then he said, likewise, you have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Now, we had read in the Ephesian letter that they rejected the Nicolaitans, and Jesus said, and, they, and them I hate too. And so the, the Ephesians had handled the Nicolaitan idea real good. But this church had not. They had succumbed to the idea of the Nicolaitans. Now, what was the Nicolaitans? Let's, let's look at an interesting word. Anybody here know the word Nike? That's the front word of Nicolaitans. Nike, it means conqueror. You know, winged foot conqueror, Nike. And laos is the last word. You know what the word laos means? It's people. And here we talk about the conquering people. The, the Nicolaitans were the conquering people. You know who they were? They were full-time professional religious leaders, so many people believe, who were trying to say that the regular people in the church of the Lord have no right to govern themselves or the affairs of the church. Do you realize that the greatest, most pitiful years of all the history of the church were when we set up the hierarchy, when we set up uh, the, the great titles and bishops and others, and they, they had total rule over the people of God. They wouldn't even let them have a Bible, and they said, we'll tell you what to believe, and we'll charge you this, and we'll do this, and they'll be in charge. Uh, many scholars believe this all began with the Nicolaitans who are saying not everybody can run things like they should, so we need to be in charge and we'll ordain ourselves to be the leaders and give ourselves titles and put ourselves in positions and we will be bosses of God's people. And Jesus said, I hate that. I thank God so very, very much for the lay leadership in our church, men and women who love this church, who give themselves to it. And if there's one thing I would say is a secret of this church, it is that we have so many people who are willing to serve the Lord and to be a part of the process, and I thank God so much for that. But that's what he meant, I think, when he said in verse 15, you hold to those who have the teachings of the Nicolaitans. And he said, for this you need to repent. Repent, or I will soon come to you. He said, I will come and punish you, and I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. In 17, Revelation 19 and verse 15, he talks about the double-edged sword that comes out of the mouth of the Lord and how destructive it really is. And so the judgment is coming. And then the reward in verse 17. 
He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give him a white stone with a new name on it, known only to him who receives it. What do you get for staying true to the Lord Christ? Well, here the Word says you get new manna, and you get a white stone with a new name on it. Well, what does that mean? Well, if you would, please turn to John chapter 6. And let's look in on an argument that Jesus had with the religious people of his day. They were deep in discussion with him. He had fed them. Remember, he fed the 5,000 people, and they liked that. And then he disappeared, and they couldn't find him. And so they want to know why he wouldn't feed them some more. And so they asked him in verse 30 of John 6, so they asked him, What miraculous sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our forefathers ate the manna in the desert, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. He said, Our forefathers had this bread to eat for, what was it, 12,500 week, days? And he said, they, they, had, they had this bread to eat. Why don't you give us bread to eat? And Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, it is not Moses who has given you bread from heaven. But it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said, Sir, from now on give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty." And then in verse, verse 49 of John 6, Jesus said, Your forefathers ate the manna in the desert, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which a man may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If a man eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. He's saying the reward for faithfulness in serving the Lord is, is Jesus Christ himself. He is the bread of life. All right, then what about the white stone? I will give you a white stone. Do you know about the white stone? You ever heard anybody say, this is a red letter day? This, is, this means it's like a holiday on the, on the calendar. This is a red letter day. This is a good day. In those days, they would say, this is a white stone day something very good. It's, it's something wonderful. They used white stones when people were judged in the courts. A black stone meant you were guilty and you had to pay the penalty. A white stone meant you were acquitted and you were looked upon as innocent. Uh, when, when somebody wanted to honor someone, they gave them a white stone with a little message on it in that day, in those primitive days. Uh, this white stone has a new name on it. I think this white stone means that you have been acquitted by Jesus Christ, that you know that your sins are forgiven because of Jesus Christ. Even though we are guilty, I remember we used to have a counselor in Dallas, and a lot of people were coming to walk the aisles and be saved because of talking with, with him. And I said, "When? what are you telling people? He said, I tell them the reason you feel guilty is because you are guilty, and you need to do something about it. And, uh, and there were a lot of things happening there. but. The fact is that uh, Jesus has said, those who know me have been accounted not guilty. Romans 5 sums up what's been said in the first four chapters. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 8, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. This white stone is God saying, I vote you not guilty. I give you the white stone. And it has a new name on it. I don't know. It, I wonder if that's a new name for us. God gave a new name to Abraham, or to Abram, called him Abraham. He gave a new name to Simon Peter. He gave a new name to Jacob. Maybe we're going to have a new name. Remember how the name is very important to God, and how in the Bible it tells you, have a good name for yourself. Did you? My parents used to say, I want you to make a good name for yourself. It means that when people say your name, they think about you. If what you're known about is not good, when they say your name, they think that about you. 
your name means this is the person who does that, or this is the person who does that, or this is the person who is that way. I think Jesus said, I'm going to give you a name which means pure and guiltless and blessed and honored by God. You will have the white stone with a new name, and you will have the hidden manna, which is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. The Bible says we are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ who has given us our life. Well, let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, we pray that you will help us to have ears to hear and to hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Father, I pray you'll help us not to get caught up in the sinful spirit of the world around us. We know that Satan may not live where we live, but we know that his host do. And all around us are those who would take away from us the joy and peace and goodness and long-suffering that would be ours as Christians. And I pray you'll help us to keep our eyes upon you, to not fall for the Nicolaitans who would want us to surrender our responsibility to you and let someone else make those decisions, who, want, who, would, who would help us not be like Balaam, not facing both ways, trying to, trying to be both of the world and in the world. And Lord, I pray you'll help us to represent you well and be the church that you would have us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. And now we, on behalf of the Lord Christ and on his authority, open the doors of this church and say you're invited. You're not invited because some little preacher stood up to say you're invited and this is what you ought to do. God himself has bought this right and he died for you. And he said, I died so that you could come and have life and I want you to come and know me and know what it is to live and to know that as you face closer and closer to the end of this life, you'll know there is waiting for you the hidden manna and the white stone with a new name on it. Let's stand quietly and you come and do God's will. Thank you.